You're listening to the Productive Muslim Podcast, Season 1, Episode 8. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Productive Muslim Podcast, the weekly podcast where we help you live a productive lifestyle so that you can be successful in this life and the hereafter. Assalamu alaikum, productive Muslims. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mufra Marif, and in today's episode, we will be taking your questions. So these are the questions which you submitted through our voicemail option on our site. And joining me on the show today is Mohammed Faris, the founder of Productive Muslim, and who's also going to be my co-host today for the Q&A episode. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Hope you guys are well. Wa alaikum as Thank you for coming on. So we have received so many questions and we were we selected out about five questions and hopefully we're trying to aim to get through at least three of these questions. So are you ready for them? Bismillah. Okay, so let's get started with our first one. So this question is from Samir and I'll just play that audio right now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hi, uh Team Productive Muslim, uh, Jazakum Allah Khair for bringing out this podcast. I think it's, 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 a, it's really a wonderful um, platform you have built uh, for people to, you know, uh, get these tiny feeds uh, on being productive Muslims. Now, uh, my challenge that I face is one of the area of planning life goals. I've attended numerous goal-setting sessions and even tried making out some plans and... Uh, uh, tried executing them, but there have been a lot of failures, and I constantly find uh, enough time in sticking to the goals of my planet. Now, I know that there are a lot of weaknesses from my end, and uh, it also builds upon my procrastination. So I want to know if you have a simple approach to build upon a goal plan, and uh, be a productive Muslim. So, Jazakum Allah Khair and Barakullah Fiqh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, okay, sounds good. So that's, that's definitely a, a big question, a question that I get a lot. Um, I guess, Samir, if, if, if I were you, I think, let's, let's forget about the past for now. Um, sometimes when we sort of try to achieve a goal and we think about all the many times we failed trying to achieve a goal, it's not the most encouraging thought to have. So first thing, just, just forget about what you have uh, sort of experienced so far. Take lessons from it, but uh, don't be too bogged down by the past. What I want you to do is think uh, fresh, think new and say, okay, uh, do something what I call a personal retreat. Go somewhere quiet, a uh, couple of week hours, maybe in the weekend, somewhere nice, maybe a beautiful park. If you're next to the sea, go somewhere, sort of go to seaside. Just pen and paper, and ask yourselves just three questions, okay? Just three questions. Um, the first one is, who am I, why I'm here, okay? Um, it it's must sounds philosophical, and I'm not trying to make it philosophical, but if you don't know who you are, who you want to be, then it kind of is hard to determine what goals you should set for yourself. A lot of people set goals for themselves without linking back to who they are and what their purpose in life is. Now, purpose, alhamdulillah, has been solved for us. As Allah said in the Quran, I've not created, created mankind and jinn except to worship me. And in another verse, Allah says, I'm placing a deputy on earth. So essentially, human beings have two main purposes. One, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. B, become his deputy. Now, that's grand, right? That's the kind of big, big purpose. Um, the question, the challenge, of course, is translating this purpose into life goal that's worth living for, something that really means a lot to you. Um, you know, within this within this bigger purpose, what is that? And I think there are two ways to find that out. Number one, a bottom up approach, which means you try different things, see what you're inclined towards, see what you like to do, and then say, well, and then test it out for six months, one year, experiment. And if things go well, then go for it. If things don't go well, you say, no, forget it. I'll give you pers- two personal examples. Um, so there was a point in my life where I thought I want to be a graphic designer. I was into graphic designing. I bought graphic designing books. I started my own graphic design studio. And I was really excited about being a graphic designer. But the moment I sort of actually lived a, a, a 
graphic design sort of lifestyle, which probably lasts a couple of years. I couldn't stand, stand editing a hundred times one poster. It was just not for me. And, and being creative every single day uh, you know, with designs was just not what I found most easily done. So I thought, you know, this is not for me. Another example, I thought, you know what, I want to become an Islamic banker. So I, you know, studied Islamic economics. I went to courses. Um, I jumped in. I should join Islamic bank. And then six months down the line, so you know what, it's not for me. So sometimes you just have to, there, that's the one approach where you do a bottom-up approach where you're testing it out. You're testing what you're inclined towards, hoping to find something that you kind of like, you know, that, that actually is aligned to what you really want to dedicate your life to and focus on. The second thing is that uh, more to top-down approach. The top-down approach is more where you sort of go to vision workshops, vision retreats, you work with a coach, uh, somebody kind of tries to analyze your skills, analyze your strengths. Um, and there's lots of these around the world these days. You can sign up to many programs that offer these services where you just sort of go through your strengths, go through weaknesses, um, you know, ask people around you until you find two or three areas that you feel like, yes, this is what I dedicate my, myself to. See, the, the key question is to find something that's easy for you. You cannot force yourself to do something that you feel I should be doing just because everyone else is doing. And that's why there's a beautiful uh, saying from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that says, ma khuliqala. Work, all of you will be made easy what you've been created for. So for some people, it's so easy for them to be a graphic designer. For some people, it's so easy for them to be a teacher. For some people, it's so easy for them to become a doctor. For some people, it's so easy for them to run a business. So each one of us has been given certain inclinations, certain um, ways of appealing to actually to, to do something and, and incline towards it. And that's, and that's kind of like what we should try to find because if you find something that you're passionate about and that you're good at and that the market is ready to pay you for, then that's called the career lottery basically. Oh, that's a career sweet spot because you have something that you care about deeply, something that you're really good at and something that you are sort of the market people are willing to pay you for. So that's, that's kind of how you find your, your purpose vision. Does this make sense? Maybe I just want to make sure I bounce it off you. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, one, one question that I have on what you mentioned regarding finding something that you're good at and how you said that there are some things that come easy to a person. Well, what about the thing in which there's a learning curve in which um, somebody – start something like I'll give you an example because it's just hard to say theoretically but I had a friend of mine so she was a teacher and then she started to doing she started to practice as a teacher and then she was saying like the first year was so hard for her like really really hard and then after that she um, mm -hmm. kept persisting with it and then she said how the next year and the years to came just started coming easy to her so how would you reconcile that great great question so there's the difference between loving something and being good at it. Um, so maybe your friend was, you know, she was passionate about teaching. She loved teaching kids. She loved the satisfaction of, of you know, kids coming up to her saying, that was an awesome teacher or something that really drove her. But she might not have been skilled at it. There was the curriculum, the lesson plans, yeah, the timings, and the, children's the behavior breaks, and the discipline <laughs> issues. <laughs> the behavior. So those skills, those skills we learn. So it's, you know, and, and, and that's so the difference in those two. So yes, sometimes you might be passionate about something, but you not might be skilled about it. Now, the skill part, that's easy to solve because the skill part, A, go to workshops, learn, experience. Um, I mean, classic example, myself, I mean, I, I dreaded public speaking. I'm a very, very introverted person. People say surprising because I stand in front of crowds and give workshops and lectures, but I just, I found it very, very hard. But because I was passionate about my message, it helped me to stand up more often. And as I stood up more often, the skill became better at, it, better at it, basically. So yes, there is a difference between passion and skills, but skills is an easier problem to solve than passion. The worst thing is when you're really good at something and that you really can't stand, that's a different story. To, that, that's kind of challenging. Completely. So if you're really good at something and you can't stand doing it, what do you mean by that? Let's say, let's say somebody who uh, is a really good accountant or really good software developer. All right. This is somebody who just they're very, very good at something, but they just don't care about it. Now, for those people, what I advise them to do is find a purpose within the larger purpose of you do. Let's say a very good accountant. Um, maybe he, he dreads doing accounting for this business uh, corporation that he kind of you know, finds very hard to, to basically feel yeah. satisfied, but he feels great helping, let's say, charities and mosques get their books in order, for example. So they got something skilled for, but now let's repackage the passion according to the larger purpose of worshiping Allah and being his deputy. So 
both, you know, in both scenarios, you can, so you can find something that's within what you're good at to, to find you. So if you, if you find yourself that you're very good at something, but you're not passionate about it for some reason, ask yourself, what can I do? How can I almost like renew my intention about this? Or how can I yeah. repurpose my skill for a better purpose? Maybe through like, yeah, different environment and stuff, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. There's, there's actually a great talk, um, a great TED talk called Job Crafting. Um, the idea there is about sometimes if you're in a job and you find it so hard to be, you know, passionate about it. For example, the rest of the broad examples of hospital janitors, right? You know, hospital janitors, low paid job, yeah. rarely appreciated like the doctors and nurses. No one really looks at you. You just go in, clean and walk out. But some, they found that some hospital janitors who are, you know, they, they repackage their purpose. They repackage their intention and said, we are healers. Like, uh, what do you mean you're healers? He said, well, if we don't clean the patient's room, well, the patient will get more infection and they'll probably die. So wow. the fact is, we're part of the healing process. So just imagine that sort of level of intention and what impact that have on just the day-to-day living, day-to-day making uh, lifestyle. That's an interesting take on that. Absolutely. So I just wanted to uh, quickly pivot to the second part of the, before we move next question. The second part of the question, I think, from, the, from, from Brother Samir was the idea of why, I mean, Okay, I have a goals. I've had goals before, and I just never had the chance to actually achieve them. So the getting, getting, getting them done, basically, uh, how to go about that. So again, once, uh, presuming that you found something that you really care about, presuming you find something that you're good at, or at least you're willing to learn how to be good at, then it's about basically dedicating the time, the focus, and the energy, the stuff we teach a productive Muslim. Time, energy, and focus towards that, what that one thing is. Now here... I suggest focus on the process more than the outcomes. What I mean by this, don't worry, for example, let's say you want to write a book, right? Don't freak out that I haven't finished my six chapters by end of next week, which you promised to do yourself. Rather focus on, I want to write 100 words a day and yeah. just focus on the process. That process, whatever that process is, writing every day, speaking every week, um, you, know, you know, calling clients, um, doing, uh, you know, reaching out to people about your project, whatever that process is, focus on that. And give yourself a timed uh, section of the day where you say, okay, for 25 minutes, for half an hour, for one or two hours, uh, once a week, twice a week, three other times a week, I have an appointment with myself to dedicate this time and my focus to this one particular part. And then when that time comes, you remove all distractions from your desk. You, um, If it's something on your desk or just remove all distractions, turn off your phone, hide your phone if possible, and basically make sure that you are for completely fully immersed in that project and if you do that continuously one time two times three times four times five times you'll start building what's called success momentum you'll start hitting mini milestones you'll start seeing that hey things are moving forward and that will give you the push to complete your project or complete whatever goal you set for yourself i would also further add to try doing that pomodoro technique as well like say for example you say during this time i'm going to complete three pomodoros which is 25 minute sessions to work on this goal that i have yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had, a, I had a coaching client once who basically said that she couldn't, um, you know, she found it hard that she was not reading her one juz a day mm. of Quran every morning. She's busy. She's got, you know, kids and, and work. And she was feeling disappointed. And I told her, how about this? Instead of putting the goalpost as finishing one juz a day, say to yourself, I'll recite half an hour every day. Now, do you have half an hour every day? She's like, yes, I do. Like, great. Just focus on that. Don't focus on the achievement, the outcome, the sort of tick in the box. Focus on the process. That half an hour dedicated every day, that's better for me as that's consistent than you beating yourself up for not finishing the one juzza, even though you spend half an hour every day. So that way, it's focusing the process more than the outcome helps you stay more consistent over the long term. Mm, that's true. Okay. And just saying, and one last advice, of course, we've, we've covered a lot more details on uh, Productive Muslim Academy. Uh, there's a whole course called a simple guide to, a practical guide to building your life goals. So check that out. It has details about how to set up life goals, what questions you should ask yourself, uh, how to achieve goals, what goals to set for yourself, and other other stuff there. So if you're if you're interested, if you really are serious about taking this step further and actually learning something practical to set up life goals and achieve them, then check out that course. It has has lots of beneficial content, Shal, that will help you and shout out. Yeah, and I can attest to that because I did that course myself. And one of my favorite questions which you asked was, what kind of experiences do you want to get out of life? And that really made me think in a different way as opposed to what do I want to achieve or what do I want to do and stuff. So that was that really helped me shape things. Sometimes I feel we go through life as almost like a tick box, right? It's like, yeah, oh, I'm got the very, degree, very guilty on that. <laughs> 
<laughs> got married, tick, have kids, tick, went hajj, tick, yeah. uh, got six figure, six figure income, tick, got, I mean, and then, and then, then what, right? It's like, so, and then what you, you, you hit all those ticks and then what, yeah. but experiences, um, especially connected to your purpose, that's powerful. That stuff completely changes you, improves your capacity, uh, completely transforms you as a human being. Mm, that's true. All right. So we'll go on to our next question that we have here. So the next question that we have is from Octa, and this is on completing projects. So this is very similar to what we just discussed, but it'll be interesting to hear it from another angle as well. So I just played that out right now. Assalamu alaikum. Um, so my question is about getting distracted and finding ways to stop myself from continuously becoming distracted. Um, I actually suffer from ADHD. So this is something which has been relevant throughout my life. And I feel that because I haven't been able to complete many of the projects that I uh, embark on, that my self-esteem has dropped to an all-time low right now. Um, So in order for me to be able to start building up my self-confidence again, um, I want to be able to increase my focus and concentration to the point that I can finish tasks from beginning to end and then get the satisfaction of knowing that I'm still able to be able to complete tasks and complete tasks to a high standard. Um, So if you could give any advice on how I could increase my concentration and focus, uh, then that would be um, very helpful. Jazakallah khair. Okay, um, that's a great question. First of all, I'll start off with a disclaimer that I'm not a medical expert, so um, I'm not sort of uh, trained in how to handle ADHD or uh, doing ADHD clients. So just just that disclaimer in the beginning in case. So any advice that I give, uh, please, please, please do sort of double check it, triple check it, make sure that it's something that is in line with, with any sort of medical advice that you're getting as well, because that's, that's very important. Um, having said that, um, I'm going to say something a bit controversial, but uh, and I hope that you, you, you understand what I mean by this. It's, it's, uh, sometimes we tend to blame our conditions um, for not achieving certain successes in life. We tend to blame the environment around us, uh, the country we're born in, um, the family we're in, um, the whatever sort of uh, difficulties we, fail, we face, and use that as our scapegoat if not, if we don't achieve the results that we are hoping to achieve. Um, and that's sort of my challenge to you and challenge the questioner, which is, um, you, you probably said, you know, you, you, I'm just asking, and, and please don't, don't take this in a personal way. The question I'm asking is, have you simply, uh, every time you fail to achieve a goal, just simply label, oh, that's because I have ADHD, um, and use that as an excuse to perhaps not push yourself a bit more. Of course, you might have to push yourself further and harder than other people, but have you used that as, as a scapegoat? And, and the reason I'm saying this is because there are examples of people who, are, who have ADHD and who have achieved success. So it's not a, um, almost like a, 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 a disease or illness that completely uh, destroys somebody's any chance of success. Uh, and the evidence of that is that people perhaps with even worse conditions were able to achieve success. So I think that's probably my first kind of challenge and pushback. Uh, just so that we try to see things from a, from a, okay, well, assuming that this feedback is, is at its place, what else can we do, right? What else can we do to make sure we maximize, you know, my concentration, uh, you know, regardless of the condition that I have. So that's the, that's the first thing. Second thing is, what are you doing right now to aggravate your ADHD or aggravate your lack of concentration? Um, are you consistently and obsessively checking your phone? Um, are you checking your phone first thing in the morning after, after waking up? Are you checking your phone before going to sleep? Um, are you, is your phone always within an arm's length reach and you just, just complete and, and always sort of you're bombarding yourself with so much things around you? Um, that's, that's an issue because if you are able to perhaps even for a short while, like example, charge your phone in a different room, buy a $5 alarm clock and use that to wake yourself up, and then for the first hour in the morning, not check your phone, how will that help your concentration? If, for example, you, when you walk into work or walk into your office, you hide your phone completely because the studies have shown that even having a phone visibly in front of you, even if it's face down, yeah. you still feel distracted. You I still have relate. this urge to, 
to flip the phone and check it. So that's another thing. So, so what can you do to increase the potential of the focus muscle? Because focus is a muscle and concentration is a muscle. And I'm sure there's ways for you to improve it. So try to see how you can manage that concentration by, like I said, first in the morning for an hour at least, don't check your phone. Uh, if I were you, I would delete any social media apps on my phone and I'll only check Facebook, Twitter on the desktop, you know, which kind of, kind of puts a cumbersome way to check it. Um, I'll delete anything that I'm obsessively checking all the time. I'll remove those annoying uh, red badge icons. You have 55 unread messages because those kind of make you want to check that. So delete, the, remove those notifications, turn off, make your phones on silent. And just you know, be in a way that you're in control of these devices instead of you being under the mercy of these devices. So that's kind of my second um, advice on that. Uh, the third advice is see how if you can make small wins. Um, small wins meaning how can I work? Okay, maybe I'm not able to do from start to finish an entire task in one sitting. But as, as I mentioned earlier, can I use Pomodoro technique? Can I use 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 25 minutes? of pure concentration on this one task. I won't finish the whole thing, but I will finish 10%, 20% of it. If I do three, four, five settings, I'll actually finish the whole task. And that way, again, you're not obsessed or stressed that you haven't finished a task in one sitting. You're saying to yourself, I've completed one Pomodoro. I've completed one time session. And that gives you momentum. That gives success momentum. That gives you that push. Say, hey, alhamdulillah, if I could achieve this, what else can I achieve? And that really helps you move forward um, in your in your work. So I feel these so three three advice. Number one is ask yourself maybe maybe look up biographies of people who have ADHD and are successful. I know that I know Sir Richard Branson, for example, is an example of someone who has ADHD and is successful. And there are many many others. Um, number two, try to be in control of your technology around you and not aggravate your sort of lack of concentration. Number three, uh, try to focus on, again on the process and not on sort of ticking the boxes, saying I've completed this task or not. And I hope those three help. And again, uh, we have we actually do have a course purely focused on this um, in the academy, Productivism Academy, called How to Manage Focus in the Age of Distraction. Because whether you have ADHD or not, we are all suffering from lack of focus and lack of concentration. And we all need help with that part. And it's very powerful because in today's world, those who focus and those who cannot focus is the difference between success and failure. You know, the person who can focus, they can study better, they can work harder. They can get things done. They can focus on relationships. They can focus on uh, seeing projects through. There's so much benefit comes to focus. So it should be imperative. You should try to do everything you can to regain and re um, sort of um, exercise that focus muscle you have. And inshallah ta'ala, I ask Allah ta'ala to help you and help all of us, you know, really achieve that focus, inshallah ta'ala. Any thoughts, uh, Mifra? Yeah, I also want to add to that and ask about the, issue regarding low self-esteem because when when you get caught in that as in you set all these goals and then you find yourself not able to achieve them and then you just find yourself in a rut and you can't get out of it so that I feel is also very important to address as well because if our mindset is on a low then we wouldn't want to kind of implement these techniques that um we can in order to get ourselves moving so I'm interested in knowing your thoughts on that like how can we get out of that low self-esteem mindset because i think that's also equally as important as the techniques on how to get things done got it got it um okay okay i'm gonna mention another controversial thing now um (laughs) basically the idea is that controversial episode (laughs) i know we live in an era where um people have this i can do everything i don't need any help i am super mad super woman right and asking for help or if you're someone who cannot pick yourself up and exercise every day, if someone who cannot pick yourself up and not eat dessert, you're considered a loser and you consider someone who has low self-esteem issues. Now, I want to come back and remind people that we are slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost. And that's why in a chapter that we recite 17 times a day, we say, or Allah, we worship you alone, but we need your help. We need help. So, it shouldn't, we shouldn't try to almost shun somebody who says, I need help. We shouldn't try to shun people who say, well, I don't know how to get there. Um, and most importantly, we shouldn't shun the powerful connection between the slave and the master, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and really help ourselves focus. I mean, my, my advice, and this should be the first advice to, to, the, to the question, it would be to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and really ask him, beg him, to help you overcome this, this situation and help them to improve your focus. And by the way, just by increasing 
your level of concentration in salah and in dua, you'll see a knock-on effect on other parts of your day. So, yes, you know, yes, there is some, you know, you need some kind of basic level of self-esteem. I'm not saying you should be completely, um, you know, um, have low self-esteem and hope for the best. You have, but the, the self-esteem comes from knowing not that I'm the best, I'm smart, I'm strong. It's from knowing that I am the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the most powerful, who is the most merciful, who will help me in this situation. And that reframing will completely transform the way you look at these things and give you that hope whenever you feel like losing hope, whenever you feel like, I can't do this. But hold on. You know, there's, there's a Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us, yes. Ista'in billah wa la ta'jaz. You know, seek help from Allah and never say, never, never feel deficient, never feel like, oh, I can't do this. Ista'in billah wa la ta'jaz. Seek help from Allah and don't say that I can't do it. And that's why the famous uh, dua that we recommend to say, Allah, I seek help from, uh, seek refuge in you from anxiety and sadness and laziness and, and deficiency or not being able to do something. So you ask Allah for protection from those things. You, you know, the Prophet would say, hey, I'm the Prophet. I'm, I can do all this myself. Yeah. But instead, he asked Allah for help. So I think that is the reframe we need um, to really, really push forward in our goals and achievements. Yeah, that's true. And I think that's, I think that's very vital to hear as well because like when you even look at the Prophet bi- biography and see how much ups and downs he had in his life in which he experienced things didn't go as he wanted to. By being able to turn back and having hope in Allah got him back up again. Absolutely. I mean, classic examples when he was kicked out of Taif, classic example when he lost his wife and his uncle and his son, yeah. classic example when he, when he, you know, when he, he got affected in the Battle of Uhud. I mean, these are classic setbacks. I mean, any of these situations would probably set us back for, for one of us who have unfortunately weak Iman, would probably be, you know, decades of depression. But he, yes, he felt sad. Yes, he cried. Yes, you know, sadness was, as I said, when he lost his son, but our, 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 you know, our hearts are feeling sad. Our eyes are, are tearing, but our tongue only says, please, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that ability to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those situations, that is powerful. That's the stuff that, you know, forget all the self-esteem help books out there. This yeah. is what you need. This is what you need to move forward in your life, inshallah. All right, so we're actually getting closer to our the ending of our episode, and I had a few a few more questions here, but since uh, our time has run out, unfortunately, um, I'll have to wrap up the show. So just before we do that, is there anything else you want to add on before we end? Oh no, thank you. First of all, alhamdulillah, I think this show is the uh, I believe is the last show for this season of the Product Muslim Podcast. Um, alhamdulillah, thank you so much, Mifra and Saima and all the team members who worked so hard to build this uh, platform, build this new way to listen in, interact. I was so happy to hear the questions that came through and um, I'd be more than happy to answer more, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair and I pray for a successful season two, inshallah ta'ala, of the Barakas Podcast. Thank you so much. Barakallah, people. Inshallah. Thanks for coming on. All right, so that wraps up our Q&A episode and it also wraps up season one of this podcast. So can you believe it? An entire season has finished and it's already March this year, SubhanAllah. It's just amazing how time flies and it just keeps flying. And it's times like this you realize whatever you do, time will always pass and it's up to us to really make the most out of it. So in saying that, inshallah, we will be coming back with season two soon and details on when that will be happening will be released on our newsletter. So if you're not a part of our newsletter, please do subscribe by heading over to our Productive Muslim website and you can do so there. Also, if you would like to leave a voice message, as you heard in today's show, then you can do so by going over to ProductiveMuslimPodcast.com and over there, you'll find an area to leave your voicemail. So you can do so through your computer. No need for any special devices or anything to do so. Or you don't need a call anywhere. You just record it straight from your computer and it's done. So I hope to hear from you and hear your questions that you have for us. Finally, I just want to say on behalf of the entire Productive Muslim team, a big thank you to you all for listening to our podcast really without you this podcast won't be possible so i just want to take the time to thank you for tuning in thank you for giving us your time to listen to this podcast and i look forward to speaking with you all in our next season inshallah until then remember be sincere and work hard